This is a Media Lab podcast. Welcome to Putting Together, the podcast that goes through the entire body of work of Stephen Sondheim, show by show and song by song. My name is Kyle Marshall, your self-described Sondheim expert. Well, we have finally reached the Sweeney Todd season. Yes, we are going to be here for many a month, you and I, going through this very big show. But I thought what we should really start with before we start jumping into the music, into the songs, is just a little bit of the backstory of Sweeney Todd himself, itself, however we want to break that down. And so I'm just going to go through kind of the structure of this week's episode where I'm going to share with you some of the earliest writings that we have of the Sweeney Todd character, how it has been adapted throughout the years, what inspired Sondheim to adapt this show for himself and his other collaborators, and finally to end off with like his inspirations as far as what the music sounds like within this show. And the next week, we'll finally get into talking about the ballads. I very much hope that whatever holiday you celebrate at this time of year, that you are having a great one. I know that for many of us, that means, you know, staying kind of where we are, perhaps not even being able to see family once again this year. But if I can be just real for a tiny moment here at the beginning of the show, I do want to express my deep gratitude for everybody who listens to this show, who comments, who sends me messages, who debate me. All all of those things are so welcome. I love doing this show. And over the past year, it has definitely helped me through some pretty dark times. Some that I have shared on this show and some I have not. But I'm glad that there is a community that can pool around musical theater in general, Stephen Sondheim specifically. And I can't wait to see what the next year holds. Fingers crossed that I actually do get to go to New York City. Anyways, let's get into this week's show. His skin's pale and his eye was eye. He shaped the faces of gentlemen who never thereafter were again. He trod a path that few have trod. Did swing it high. Sweeney Todd is definitely based on something. There seems to be a bit of a disagreement on exactly what that is. However, whatever the original story was, whatever that first bit of inspiration, what we do know for sure is that in the years of 1846 to 47, there was a Penny Dreadful serial called The String of Pearls that was published. A Penny Dreadful, for those of you who may not know, it would have been kind of like a CD tabloid of the time, you know, stuff that was going to rile people up or bask in their trashy tastes. Like if you were to pick up a copy of the National Enquirer, for instance, right? Maybe you just do it for fun. You want to you want to read about Bat Boy, even though you know that Bat Boy doesn't exist, or does he? But we enjoy those stories, right? We enjoy sometimes just filling our heads with trash, utter garbage, and just enjoying that storytelling for ourselves. There also seems to be a bit of a discrepancy on who the actual author is of that Penny Dreadful. The original person that was credited was James Malcolm Reimer, but also Thomas Peckett Prest has been credited with actually being the person who wrote them. My copy of A String of Pearls is credited to James Malcolm Reimer. So I thought it would be fun to just kind of share with you the opening chapter of what that Penny Dreadful would have been all those years ago. Think that you're just listening to an audiobook here for the next few minutes as I delve in to Chapter 1, The Strange Customer at Sweeney Todd's. Before Fleet Street had reached its present importance, and when George III was young, and the two figures who used to strike the chimes at old St. Dunstan's church were in all their glory, being a great impediment to errand boys on their progress and a matter of gaping curiosity to country people, 
there stood close to the sacred edifice a small barber shop, which was kept by a man of the name of Sweeney Todd. How it was that he came by the name of Sweeney as a Christian appellation, we are at a loss to conceive, but such was his name, as might be seen in extremely corpulent yellow letters over his shop window by anyone who chose there to look for it. Barbers by that time in Fleet Street had not become fashionable, and no more dreamt of calling themselves artists than of taking the tower by storm. Moreover, they were not, as they are now, constantly slaughtering fine fat bears, and yet somehow people had hair on their heads just the same as they have at present, without the aid of that unctuous auxiliary. Moreover, Sweeney Todd, in common with his brethren in those really primitive sorts of times, did not think it at all necessary to have any waxen effigies of humanity in his windows. There was no languishing young lady looking over the left shoulder in order that a profusion of auburn tresses might repose upon her lily neck, and great conquerors and great statesmen were not then, as they are now, held up to public ridicule with dabs of rouge upon their cheeks, a quantity of gunpowder scattered in for a beard, and some bristles sticking on end for eyebrows. No. Sweeney Todd was a barber of the old school, and he never thought of glorifying himself on account of any extraneous circumstance. If he had lived in Henry VIII's palace, it would have been all the same to him as Henry VIII's dog kennel, and he would scarcely have believed human nature to be so green as to pay an extra sixpence to be shaven and shorn in any particular locality. A long pole painted white with a red stripe curling spirally round it projected into the street from his doorway, and on one of the panes of glass in his window was presented the following couplet. Easy shaving for a penny, as good as you will find any. We do not put these lines as a specimen of the poetry of the age. They may have been the production of some young Templar, but if they were a little wanting in poetic fire, that was amply made up by the clear and precise manner in which they set forth what they intended. The barber himself was a long, low-jointed, ill-put-together sort of fellow with an immense mouth and such huge hands and feet that he was, in his way, quite a natural curiosity. And, what was more wonderful, considering his trade, there never was seen such a head of hair as Sweeney Todd's. We know not what to compare it to. Probably it came nearest to what one might suppose to be the appearance of a thick-set hedge, in which a quantity of small wire had gotten tangled. In truth, it was a most terrific head of hair, and as Sweeney Todd kept all his combs in it, some said his scissors likewise, when he put his head out of the shop door to see what sort of weather it was, he might have been mistaken for some Indian warrior with a very remarkable headdress. He had a sort of disagreeable kind of unmirthful laugh which came in at all sorts of times when nobody else saw anything to laugh at at all, and which sometimes made people start again, especially when they were being shaved, and Sweeney Todd would stop short in that operation to indulge in one of those cachinatory effusions. It was evident that the remembrance of some very strange and out of the way joke must occasionally flit across him and then he gave his hyena-like laugh, but it was so short, so sudden, striking upon the ear for a moment and then gone. The people have been known to look up at the ceiling and on the floor and all around them to know from whence it had come, scarcely supposing it possible that it proceeded from mortal lips. Mr. Todd squinted a little to add to his charms, and so we think that by this time the reader may in his mind's eye see the individual whom we wish to present to him. Some thought him a careless enough harmless fellow, with not much sense in him, and at times they almost considered he was a little cracked. But there were others, again, who shook their heads when they spoke of him, and while they could say nothing to his prejudice except that they certainly considered he was odd, yet when they came to consider what a great crime and misdemeanor it really is in the world to be odd, we shall not be surprised at the ill odor in which Sweeney Todd was held. But for all that he did, a most thriving business, and was considered by his neighbors to be a very well-to-do sort of man, and decidedly, in city phraseology, warm. It was so handy for the young students in the temple to pop over to Sweeney Todd's to get their chins new rasped, so that from morning to night he drove a good business and was evidently a thriving man. There was only one thing that seemed in any way to detract from the great prudence of Sweeney Todd's character, and that was that he rented a large house, of which he occupied nothing but the shop and parlor, leaving the upper part entirely useless and obstinately refusing to let it on any terms whatever. Such was the state of things, AD 1785, as regarded Sweeney Todd. The day is drawing to a close, and a small drizzling kind of rain is falling, so that there are not many passengers in the streets, and Sweeney Todd is sitting in his shop looking keenly in the face of a boy, who stands in an attitude of trembling subjection before him. You will remember, said Sweeney Todd, and he gave his countenance a most horrible twist as he spoke. You will remember, Tobias Rag, that you are now my apprentice. 
that you have of me had board, washing, and lodging, with the exception that you don't sleep here, and you take your meals at home, and that your mother, Mrs. Rag, does your washing, which she may very well do, being a laundress in the temple, and making no end of money. As for lodging, you lodge here, you know, very comfortably in the shop all day. Now, are you not a happy dog? Yes, sir, said the boy timidly. You will acquire a first-rate profession, and quite as good as the law, which your mother tells me she would have put you to, only that a little weakness of the headpiece unqualified you. And now, Tobias, listen to me, and treasure up every word I say. Yes, sir. I'll cut your throat from ear to ear. If you repeat one word of what passes in this shop, or dare to make any supposition, or draw any conclusion from anything you see or hear, or fancy you see or hear, now you understand me. I'll cut your throat from ear to ear. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. I won't say nothing. I wish, sir, as I may be made into veal pies at Luffett's and Bell Yard if I as much say a word. Smitty Todd rose from his seat and opening his huge mouth, he looked at the boy for a minute or two in silence, as if he fully intended swallowing him, but he had not quite made up his mind where to begin. Very good, he said at length. I am satisfied. I am quite satisfied. And mark me, the shop and the shop only is your place. Yes, sir. And if any customer gives you a penny, you can keep it so that if you get enough of them, you'll become a rich man. Only I will take care of them for you, and when I think you want them, I will let you have them. Run out and see what's o'clock by St. Dunstan's. There was a small crowd collected opposite the church, for the figures were about to strike three quarters past six, and among the crowd was one man who gazed with such curiosity as anybody at the exhibition. Now for it, he said. They were going to begin, well, that is, ingenious. Look at the fellow lifting up his club, and down it comes bang upon the old bell. The three quarters were struck by the figures, and then the people who had loitered to see it done, many of whom had, day by day, looked at the same exhibition for years past, walked away, with the exception of the man who seemed so deeply interested. He remained, and crouching at his feet was a noble-looking dog, who looked likewise up at the figures, and who, observing his master's attention to be closely fixed upon them, endeavored to show as great an appearance of interest as he possibly could. What do you think of that dog, Hector? said the man. The dog gave a short, low whine, and then the master proceeded. There's a barber shop opposite, so before I go any further, as I have got to see the ladies, although it's on a very melancholy errand, for I have got to tell them that poor Mark Ingestrief is no more, and heaven knows what poor Joanna will say. I think I should know her by his description of her, poor fellow. It grieves me to think now how he used to talk about her in the long night watches, when all was still and not a breath of air touched a curl upon his cheek. I could almost think I saw her sometimes, as he used to tell me of her soft beaming eyes, her little gentle pouting lips, and the dimples that played about her mouth. Well, it's of no use grieving. He is dead and gone, poor fellow, and the salt water washes over as brave as heart as ever beat. His sweetheart Joanna, though, shall have the string of pearls for all that, and if she cannot be Mark and Gestry's wife in this world, she shall be rich and happy, poor young thing, while she stays in it. That is to say, as happy as she can be, and she must just look forward to meeting him aloft where there are no squalls or tempests. And so I'll go and get shaved at once. He crossed the road towards Sweeney Todd's shop, and stepping down the low doorway, he stood face to face with the odd-looking barber. The dog gave a low growl and sniffed the air. Why, well, Hector, said the master, what's the matter? Down, sir, down. I have a mortal fear of dogs, said Sweeney Todd. Would you mind him, sir, sitting outside the door and waiting for you if it's all the same? Only look at him. He's going to fly at me. Then you are the first person he ever touched without provocation, said the man. But I suppose he don't like your looks, and I must confess I ain't much surprised at that. I have seen a few rum-looking guys in my time, but hang me if I ever saw such a figurehead as yours. <laughs> What the devil noise was that? It was only me, said Sweeney Todd. I laughed. Laughed? Do you call that a laugh? I suppose you caught it if somebody who died of it. If that's your way of laughing, I beg you won't do it anymore. Stop the dog. Stop the dog. I can't have dogs running into my back parlor. Here, Hector, here, cried his master. Get out. Most unwillingly, the dog left the shop and crouched down close to the outer door, which the barber took care to close, muttering something about a draught of air coming in, and then, turning to the apprentice boy, who was screwed up in a corner, he said, Tobias, my lad, go to Leadenhall Street and bring a small bag of the thick biscuits from Mr. Peterson's. Say they are for me. Now, sir, I suppose you want to be shaved, and it is well you have come here, for there ain't a shaven shop, although I say it, in the city of London that ever thinks of polishing anybody off as I do. I tell you what it is, Master Barber, if you come that laugh again, I will get up and go. I don't like it, and there is an end of it. Very good, said Swinney Todd, as he mixed up a lather. Who are you? Where did you come from? And where are you going? That's cool, at all events. Damn it! 
What do you mean by putting the brush in my mouth? Now, don't laugh, and since you are so fond of asking questions, just answer me one. Oh, yes, of course. What is it, sir? Do you know a Mr. Oakley who lives somewhere in London and is a spectacle maker? Yes, to be sure I do. John Oakley, the spectacle maker in 4th Street. And he's got a daughter named Joanna that the young bloods call the Flower of 4th Street. Ah, oh, poor thing, do they? <laughs> now, confound you. What are you laughing at now? What do you mean by it? Didn't you say, ah, oh, poor thing? Just turn your head a little on one side. That will do. You have been to sea, sir. Yes, I have. And have only now lately come up the river from an Indian voyage. Indeed. Where can my strop be? I had it this minute. I must have laid it down somewhere. Well, an odd thing that I can't see it. It's very extraordinary. What can have become of it? Oh, I recollect. I took it into the parlor. Sit still, sir. I shall not be gone a moment. Sit still, sir, if you please. By the by, you can amuse yourself with the courier, sir, for a moment. Sweeney Todd walked into the back parlor and closed the door. There was a strange sound suddenly compounded by a rushing noise and then a heavy blow. <laughs> Immediately after which Sweeney Todd emerged from his parlor and folding his arms, he looked upon the vacant chair where his customer had been seated, but the customer was gone, leaving not the slightest trace of his presence behind except his hat, and the Sweeney Todd immediately seized and thrust into a cupboard that was at one corner of the shop. What's that? He said. What's that? I thought I heard a noise. The door was slowly opened, and Tobias made his appearance, saying, If you please, sir, I forgot the money, and have run all the way back from St. Paul's Churchyard. In two strides, Todd reached him, and clutching him by the arm, he dragged him into the farthest corner of the shop, and then he stood opposite to him, glaring in his face, and with such a demonic expression that the boy was frightfully terrified. Speak, said Todd, speak, and speak the truth, or your last hour has come. How long were you peeping through the door before you came in? Peeping, sir. Yes, peeping. Don't repeat my words, but answer me at once. You will find it better for you in the end. I wasn't peeping, sir, at all. Sweeney Todd drew a long breath as he then said in a strange, shrieking sort of manner, which he intended no doubt should be jocose. Well, well, very well. If you did peep, what then? It's no matter. I only wanted to know, that's all. It was quite a joke, wasn't it? Quite funny, though uh, rather odd, eh? Why don't you laugh, you dog? Come now, there is no harm done. Tell me what you thought about it at once. And we will be merry over it. Very merry. <laughs> I don't know what you mean, sir, said the boy, who was quite as much alarmed at Mr. Todd's mirth as he was at his anger. I don't know what you mean, sir. I only just came back because I hadn't any money to pay for the biscuits at Peterson's. I mean nothing at all, said Todd, suddenly turning upon his heel. What's that scratching at the door? Tobias opened the shop door, and there stood the dog, who looked wistfully round the place and then gave a howl that seriously alarmed the barber. It's a gentleman's dog, sir, said Tobias. It's a gentleman's dog, sir, that was looking at old St. Dunstan's clock and then came in here to be shaved. It's funny, ain't it, sir, that the dog didn't go away with his master. Why don't you laugh if it's funny? Turn out the dog, Tobias. We'll have no dogs here. I hate the sight of him. Turn him out. Turn him out. I would, sir, in a minute, but I'm afraid he wouldn't let me somehow. Only look, sir. Look, see? See what he is at now? Did you ever see such a violent fellow, sir? Why, he will have down the cupboard door. Stop him! Stop him! The devil's in the animal! Stop him, I say! The dog was certainly getting the door open when Sweeney Todd rushed forward to stop him, but that he was soon admonished of the danger of doing, for the dog gave him a grip of the leg, which made him give such a howl and left the animal to do its pleasure. This consisted in forcing open the cupboard door and seizing upon the hat which Sweeney Todd had thrust therein, and dashing out of the shop with it in triumph. The devil's in the beast, muttered Todd. He's off, Tobias. You said you saw the man who owned that fiend of a cur looking at St. Dunstan's church? Yes, sir. I did see him there. If you recollect, you sent me to see the time, and the figures were just going to strike three quarters past six, and before I came away, I heard him say that Mark and Gestry was dead, and Joanna should have the string of pearls. Then I came in, and then, if you recollect, sir, he came in, and the odd thing you know to me, sir, is that he didn't take his dog with him, because you know, sir. Because what? shouted Todd. Because people generally do take their dogs with them, you know, sir, and, and may I be made into one of Mrs. Lovett's pies if I don't? Hush! Someone comes. It's old Mr. Grant from the temple. How do you do, Mr. Grant? Glad to see you looking so well, sir. It does one's heart good to see a gentleman of your years looking so fresh and hearty. Sit down, sir. A little this way, if you please. Shaved, I suppose? Yes, Todd, yes. Any news? No, sir. Nothing stirring. Everything very quiet, sir, except the high wind. They say it blew the king's hat off yesterday, and he bored Lord North's. Trade is dull too, sir. I suppose people won't come out to be cleaned and dressed in a mizzling rain. We haven't had anybody in the shop for an hour and a half. Lord, sir said Tobias. You forgot the seafaring gentleman with the dog, you know, sir. Ah, so I do, said Todd. He went away, and I saw him get into some disturbance, I think just at the corner of the market. 
I wonder I didn't meet him, sir, said Tobias, for I came that way, and then so very odd leaving his dog behind him. Yes, very, said Todd. Will you excuse me a moment, Mr. Grant? Tobias, my lad, I just want you to lend me a hand in the parlor. Tobias followed Todd very unsuspectingly into the parlor, but when they got there and the door was closed, the barber sprang upon him like an enraged tiger, and by grappling him by the throat, he gave his head such a succession of knocks against the wainscot that Mr. Grant must have thought that some carpenter was at work. Then he tore a handful of his hair out, after which he twisted him around and dealt him such a kick that he was flung sprawling into a corner of the room. And then, without a word, the barber walked out again to his customer, and he bolted the parlor door on the outside, leaving Tobias to digest the usage he had received at his leisure and in the best way he could. When he came back to Mr. Grant, he apologized for keeping him waiting by saying, It became necessary, sir, to teach my new apprentice a little bit of his business. I have left him studying it now. There is nothing like teaching young folks at once. Oh, said Mr. Grant with a sigh. I know what it is to let young folks grow wild, for although I have neither chick nor child of my own, I had a sister's son to look to, a handsome, wild, harem scarum sort of fellow, as like me, as one pea is like another. I tried to make a lawyer of him, but it wouldn't do, and it's now more than two years ago he left me altogether, and that there were some good traits about Mark. Mark, sir? Did you say Mark? Yes, that was his name. Mark and Gestry. God knows what's become of him. Oh, said Sweeney Todd, and he went on lathering the chin of Mr. Grant. All right, it's time for me to break into this episode to let you know about the people and organizations to help this show continue to go. If you would like to help support this show for absolutely free, you can give a rating and review on whatever app you listen to podcasts in. That's greatly appreciated. And if you'd like to help monetarily, which will only help to grow and make the show better, you can go to our Patreon page. Please do not donate if it impacts you negatively financially. I also need to give a huge thank you to the God That's Good tier from Patreon, the suave sextet of Jack, Todd, Carrie, Witty, Louise, and Christopher. Putting together is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. The Alberta Podcast Network promotes and supports Alberta-made podcasts and connects their audiences with Alberta-based businesses and organizations. This week we were brought to you by the Alberta Podcast Network, so let's go and listen to one of our other great shows. In a world where boring dinners and ungrateful children make cooking almost unbearable. Whoa, that's a little too dramatic. Let's try this again. I'm Heather Dyer. I'm Erin Wager. And I'm Sarah Soma Sundaram. This is Three Kitchens, a podcast about home cooking. Whether you like cooking or you just like eating, join us to talk about food. We'll have new episodes of Three Kitchens every Tuesday, wherever you listen to podcasts. Three Kitchens. They'll tickle your funny bone, wet your appetite, and warm your heart. Did that guy think he was Bruce Wayne? <laughs> I kind of liked it, actually. He made us sound super badass. <laughs> <laughs> This episode of Putting It Together is also brought to you by Alberta Association of Optometrists proudly celebrating a century of caring for Albertans. It happens. Many people don't call their optometrists first for urgent eye care when they need it. From spring cleaning mishaps to winter eye infections, if you or your family have an eye emergency, doctors of optometry are trained to diagnose, treat, and prescribe medications. No referral necessary. And just a reminder, Alberta health coverage is available towards your urgent eye care appointments. To find an optometrist in your area, visit optometrists.ab.ca. The Alberta Association of Optometrists represents almost 800 doctors of optometry in over 80 communities across the province. Members are highly trained, regulated health professionals who provide primary eye care and vision care to Albertans. Learn more at optometrists.ab.ca. <laughs> Uh, doing the Sunni Todd voice, which no one asked me to, but I did anyways, has completely ruined my throat. So, <laughs> let's try to get through the rest of this episode, shall we? So first and foremost, we have that Penny Dreffel, of course, like I said, that was published back in the mid-1800s. The whole, like, uh, idea about Sweeney Todd is something that became part of, like, 
urban legend, myth, just the, the cultural zeitgeist of the UK. Angela Lansbury's talked about this, even though she had never read the story, seen a production of it, seen a movie adaptation of it. She knew what Sweeney Todd meant. If someone said, like, Sweeney Todd would be after you, she, insti- she instinctively knew the terror that that invoked, much like when we say, like, the boogeyman is after you here in North America. Now, since that time, it has been adapted in a bunch of different mediums. Specifically for film, it's been adapted quite a few times. Two of the earliest times that are actually still available for you to watch. There is a 1928 version that's directed by Walter West. It's a silent film. It stars Moore Marriott as Sweeney Todd. And you can watch it for free on YouTube. It is available for you there to watch. The other probably most common known version, or at least the early versions, is the 1936 version directed by George King and starring Todd Slaughter as Sweeney Todd. <laughs> I'll soon polish you off, trade slack. Not a single customer today. I pine for something exciting to happen. So I'll just put a beautiful edge on my beautiful razor in case someone happens to come in. <laughs> Todd Slaughter, I should point out, also portrayed Sweeney Todd a bunch of times on stage. It was kind of his like go-to performance that he would do. So this film is like one of the only remaining remnants of what his performance on stage would have felt like as well. Both of these examples are also very close to the original Penny Dreadful serials, which is that Sweeney Todd really is just motivated by money. He wants to kill all these people because he's evil, but also he wants to hoard the money. That is what his main motivation is. It has really nothing to do with family or anything like that. We'll get to it in a moment about how that was infused into this story. I, I will say there's a bunch of other adaptations throughout the decades that have been put to film and not even talking about all the uh, adaptations of the Sondheim Hugh Wheeler collaboration, but like just adaptations of the Sweeney Todd story. Now, one of the big things here, just by listening to that first chapter, is that there is a bit of a difference in probably plot that you understand. Sweeney Todd is a monster from the very beginning in these stories. He is not this guy coming back from being imprisoned in Australia. He's not trying to search for a lost wife and daughter. He is a maniac. He is a terrible person. He is a monster right from the very beginning. The Mrs. Lovett character, which does show up later on into the story, had kind of two main things, which is like unwitting co-conspirator is forced into a collaboration with Sweeney Todd against uh, very much under duress. Although some adaptations did have her basically being more into it than that. The 60s and 70s seems to be like this big resurgence of the Sweeney Todd story. In 1962, a production called Sweeney Todd was adapted into this four-act melodrama by playwright Brian J. Burton, who composed some songs and lyrics for it, and that was presented in Birmingham for the first time. The one that's going to be more conducive to our discussion here today is the show called Sweeney Todd, The Demon Barber of Fleet Street, written by playwright Christopher Bond. This is what brings us the story that we basically know from the musical. Uh, He said straight up, Across Dumas' The Count of Monte Cristo, with Tourneur's The Revenger's Tragedy, added elements of pastiche Shakespeare and a sort of blankish verse for Sweeney, the judge and the lovers to talk, borrowed the name of the author of The Prisoner of Zenda, Anthony Hope, for my sailor boy, remembered some market patter I'd learned as a child, and adopted the wit and wisdom of Brenda, who ran a greengrocer shop opposite my house, for Mrs. Lovett's ruminations upon life, death, and the state of her sex life. He also added more for the Tobias character to do, which he himself played because he did this all when he was 23. This is according to the Stephen Sondheim Encyclopedia. So as fate would have it, this production, which in- did include like these parlor songs in between the different scenes, was being directed by John Dexter. John Dexter already had a Sondheim connection as he had been brought over to direct Do I Hear a Waltz? And so while Sondheim was actually over in England, seeing the revival of Gypsy starring none other than Andrew Lansbury, he goes to see this show and is enraptured by it. He loves it. And from what I believe, the very first time, if not the only time, that Sondheim was the person to spearhead the creation of the musical. He was almost like, we need to musicalize this, rather than a director or another 
book writer being like, we can musicalize this. Can you come into this project and help us out? And so he sets to work. And initially he was going to basically try and write the whole libretto himself and the music himself. And the more he worked on it, he was like, ah, there's so much plot here. I actually need the help of a real playwright to help me out. He already knew he was going to get Hal Prince, who had been working on him for the last few shows, to be the director. Hal Prince says, well, why don't you get Hugh Wheeler, who had helped out with a little night music. Hugh Wheeler comes in, he distills it down to what the core elements, and then Sondheim gets to work creating this score that he knew he wanted. And this is what uh, alerted him to the project in the very first place. He wanted to make this be a horror film on stage. In fact, it's interesting to, to read about it because it seems as if that Hal Prince and Sondheim were at odds with each other in the creation of this. Hal Prince, from day one, wanted this to be big and bold and over the top, biggest stage possible. He really did look at it as almost like an opera that he was staging. Where his Sondheim was pretty adamant, like, no, I kind of want this in like a small black box theater and really focus on scaring people. He had this idea initially of people this being a blacked out theater and you walked in and tried to find your seats in the dark, sat in and had no reprieve for like the next two and a half hours as this terror was kind of unfolded in front of you. Which is probably why Sondheim really loved the small pie shop production of Sweeney Todd. It really brought it down to the level of what he initially thought the show was supposed to be. What is true is that he's influenced, as far as the music goes, from a few different sources. I don't think he had seen any of the other like film versions of Sweeney Todd at this time, but what he had seen was Hangover Square, and that was conducted by Bernard Herrmann, this kind of genius of movie scores, something that Sondheim himself was so passionate about. He often talked about how, while he liked theater a lot, he loved movies. And in particular, he was really taken by film scores. And so Hangover Square is about this music composer who, when a certain note is played, goes into a murderous rage and starts killing people. And apparently he loved this like magic moment where like the theater is on fire. He's trying to go and kill people and he's still finishing his actual song on stage all at the same time and learned how to play that by going to it multiple times over and over and over again until he could basically play the whole thing by ear. He just played it by ear and learned and transposed it and learned how to play it himself for many, many decades afterwards. So here is some of that music from Hangover Square. Personally, I think you can tell how much of this influenced Sweeney Todd's musicality. The other thing that Sondheim was playing around with is something that other composers way before him also played around with, which is the Dies Irae. I have stated on this podcast many a time how I am not music literate. I shouldn't say that. I am not smart when it comes to talking about like why music works the way it does. This is why I focus on lyrics, because I feel like I have something to say about that. The Dies Irae has been around for a long time, specifically started in Gregorian chants way back in like the 600s. And no, I did not misspeak, the 600s. Potentially, there's a little bit of, again, debate on when exactly this started. But what it is, is a sequence of notes that when played together, sounds foreboding. But it's a very specific set of notes that Sondheim will actually use throughout the score of Sweeney Todd to signal terror, foreboding, something bad is about to happen. The swing your razor high, Sweeney, like that progression of notes is the Dies Irae. To, to, to really break it down though, in some examples here, here's a MIDI version of the Dies Irae. Once again, I think you can very clearly hear the progression of that into the score of Sweeney Todd. But just some other examples, just to have fun here. Here's a Gregorian chant example. Yes, 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 yes. 
And then to have real fun, here's Verde's Requiem Diasere, performed by the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. All of this is combining. He wants this to feel like a movie on stage. He wants to scare people really badly. The disagreement comes with how big it should actually be. How Prince wins out on that argument by putting this in a very huge theater. Putting it into the 1900 seat, what is now called the Gershwin Theater, but wasn't called the Gershwin Theater at the time. I had to look at that because it's bothering me. It was, used to be called the Eurus Theater. Now called the Gershwin Theater, it's where you go and see Wicked if you're in New York City. There's always been this debate, of course, about whether it is an opera or a musical. I like Sondheim's response, which is, if it's a musical theater company putting it on, it's a musical. If it's an opera company putting it on, then it's an opera. My personal feeling is that it's very clearly written with a musical theater intent behind it, with musical theater vocals. I feel like that's what this is. Yes, it's, I think, 80% sung through. There's underscoring through the entire thing, but it's still musical theater at the end of the day. The most wild thing for me, as we round this out, is the fact that uh, it was kind of a very quick rehearsal process. Like, as they were writing the music, they had cast pretty early who they wanted to be Sweeney and Mrs. Lovett. So uh, Sondheim knew he was writing for Len Carew's voice and for Angela Lansbury's voice. And so he said that that made the writing process a lot easier because he knew how to write for those performers in these roles. Then... Once they had secured funding, a lot of investors didn't want to invest in this show because it seemed a bit too risky. So they went with a lot of smaller donations. It was a really incredible story. Apparently, they posted something in, like I think, the New York Times. And it's got a bunch of small investors to basically bankroll most of this show. But so once they go into rehearsal period, they had four weeks of rehearsals, two weeks of previews. That's it. Four weeks of rehearsals, two weeks of previews to put this show on as they're building the set. There was no out-of-town tryouts for this one just because they could not transport that set back and forth. Specifically, they were going to go to Boston, but just couldn't do it with with the constraints that they had. And the most wild thing is that he did not have the final 20 minutes written before they went into rehearsals. So all that was done within that rehearsal period, the way they finished the show. Remarkable. In the orchestrations, I think one of those most iconic things that you hear is that loud steam whistle that happens. That was actually because of Paul Gemignani, who insisted that that be what it is. Originally, it was just going to be a gong that gets hit at the very beginning, but he was the one who pushed for that, and it's such an iconic opening to this show. And then it was met with... I wouldn't say mixed reviews. It was, it was pretty glowing as far as like the theater critics of the time. Some people pushed back about content. The biggest thing was audiences. Audiences just didn't understand what this show was. They were so used to musical comedy that something that was much more musical drama just didn't appeal to them. At least that's what a lot of the people say nowadays is that while it did eventually find its audience, and this ran for a year and a half, I should say, that year and a half run apparently only got about 59% of its initial investment back again. But audiences who eventually found it, like, love this, after they heard that uh, original Broadway cast recording, regional productions start putting it on, it gets revived all the time. The film version of the 1982 tour really put it over the edge for theater fans, and I would say that a lot of people, after seeing the Johnny Depp version, have it kind of in their mind of what this show is, based on that. That had the definitely the widest reach of anything. So that is where we're at. This is how the show kind of gets put together fairly quickly after initially wanting to put it on and getting the funding for it. And so 
Next week, what we're gonna do is start by going through all of the ballads. Which, weirdly enough, is gonna be a very long episode because there's a lot of ballads in this show, as you might suspect. So I just need to say thank you so much for listening. You can send emails to puttingittogetherpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow Sondheim Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. And you can support the show on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash puttingittogetherpodcast. Thank you to the Alberta Podcast Network and to the Alberta Association of Optometrists this week. Putting it Together is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, uh, which, by the way, you can now leave reviews on Spotify. So if you're a Spotify listener, you can now leave a rating and review. Uh, but anyways, pretty much anywhere you can get podcasts from, you can get this show. Consider subscribing so that you never miss an episode. Next week, like I said, we'll be starting the ballads. So swing your razors high as we enter into the new year. As always, a big thank you to the great Chris Taniguchi who designed the podcast artwork and to Nick Driscoll for composing our theme music. Well, we reached the end of our episode. Yes, I know. Goodbye for now.